Mayor Skoog? Who, me? Mayor Skoog? <laughs> Mayor Harvey Skoog, are you in the house? <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on to Vice Mayor. Are you here? <laughs> yes. I am. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Grossman. I'm still here. <laughs> Council Member Mallory. I'm here. Council Member Nye. Definitely here. Council Member Whiting. Here. Mayor, we have a quorum. Well, thank you, Diane. Okay, first of all, I'd like to welcome our legislators, Senator Ben. Representative Noah Campbell and Representative Springer. Let's start with each one of you uh, giving us a brief introduction. Oh. We, okay, I can explain why Jody is sitting here. Where is she? Jody's there. Jody is appointed but not sworn in yet. But she's sitting here to get ready for the tough challenges ahead of her. So welcome, Jody. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Okay, great. Now we'll start with uh, Senator Fan. You want to introduce yourself? We're, I'm checking to make sure the mic is warmed <laughs> up so it sounds like this. it's working. Thank you so much for inviting us again this year, as you do every year. It's an honor being here, and it's great seeing everybody. Happy New Year. Hope everybody had a good Christmas, and we know this is going to be a great New Year. Um, I am... Now, Senator Karen Fan, which sounds very, very weird, um, as I've mentioned to you guys before, that um, the Senate is quite a bit different than the House. Personally, I love the House. Um, it is the people's house, and so consequently, it's a lot less formal and um, um, just a lot more spirited debate going on over there. Um, been in the Senate now for one, one week. Uh, very nice. It's a little more quiet. I have... 27 bills that I'm running right now, um, which we can discuss later, but it's going to be another busy year for me. So with that, I will turn this over to Representative Campbell. Representative Campbell, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council, for inviting us. <clears throat> um, I would like to kind of tell you what I am trying to do to help uh, the county and the city uh, in respects to transportation. Um, I was selected to be the transportation chairman uh, for the House of Representatives, and as such, uh, we'll hear all transportation bills. And, and as you know, uh, every city and every county and every federal highway, uh, we really need funding to maintain them and improve them. And last year, uh, I went to six meetings throughout the state discussing transportation needs. And every meeting, the, everybody came up with the same um, needs and desires for what they want for transportation. But what was left out of the conversation was, how do you fund it? That is the essential thing. It's getting money to fund roads, bridges, infrastructure. And you know, here we have the I-17. We drive it all the time. It's a dangerous highway. If you have one accident, you'll shut that thing down for eight hours. There are proposals to have an alternate or add lanes, uh, but what is lacking is funding for that. So I have decided that uh, I, have, I have dropped a bill that is proposing a 10 cents a gallon increase in gasoline over a, a four-year period to try to get more revenue in the system. And, and let me just say this. The last time the gas tax was raised was 1992. A dollar of revenue there is worth 47 cents today. So we're not even keeping up with inflation. And cars are getting more efficient, hybrids, et cetera. So I wanted to try to do something uh, this session. And, and I know that the, the governor is probably not in favor of it. The voters may not be in favor of it, but at least there's going to be a bill being proposed that's going to be discussed. So in a sense, I'm trying to push the ball down the court a little bit, and we'll see where that goes. The second thing that would impact our county is trying to restore our lottery funding that's been taken away from us. That's a half a million dollars. They only do that the three counties, Mojave County, Pinal County, and Yavapai County. 
And uh, we have a strong coalition of representatives and senators who are going to hold out until they fairly give us our money back. We buy the tickets. How that ever came about, I never know, but Yavapai County is owed a ha $550,000 on a yearly basis. So we're going to try to get that back, and that will certainly help our county. And there are other issues with the county, uh, not so much with the cities, uh, but uh, other, other monies that they take from the counties, such as the cost we have to pay for juvenile incarceration, uh, that amount of money, it's excessive. Um, so we're looking at all of that stuff. Um, the thing, uh, I also sit on the uh, public uh, safety, federalism and public safety committees, and so I'm very interested in any of the issues that deal with our police forces, uh, camera issues. That's why I was talking to the uh, deputy chief about that. So, you know, we're there, and we certainly look for your guidance. Uh, also, uh, talking to uh, Council, uh, Council Lady Nye uh, about the biomass problems that we're trying to, to solve so we can take care of that. And it's a unique economic opportunity. And we have a lot of people working on that. And I think we're going to make some progress this first year, uh, and I hope so. So we're there. Uh, we're, it's early in the session. We don't have all of our bills out yet. Uh, but if you've got anything, any ideas, all of you know that you can pick up that telephone and call us direct. Uh, we, we'll respond right to you. And uh, we're, we're anxious to hear what you need and, and what we can do for you. So with that, uh, I'll pass this on over to S Representative David Stringer. Welcome, uh, Representative Stringer. No, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, well, as you all know, I'm sort of the uh, new guy uh, down there. And uh, it is, I will say, sort of a humbling experience. It's, it's everything I expected it to be, and unfortunately, a little bit more. There's a huge uh, learning curve uh, for a new representative, and I really didn't an anticipate that. But uh, it's probably a healthy thing for me to, uh, uh, to sort of have to start at the uh, uh, you know, at the ground level, and uh, and I'm trying to do that. I'm talking to as many of my colleagues as I can. Fortunately, I have Noel Campbell, just his office is just a few doors uh, away from mine, and on the floor of the House of Representatives, our desks are right next to each other, so Noel's going to be able to keep a close uh, eye on me, and uh, and I'll be able to uh, use him as a, as a mentor, and I expect to do that. With respect to the education stuff that Noel was just talking about, I think I've already co-sponsored a couple of the uh, bills I have not signed on yet uh, to the bill uh, to raise gas taxes. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's not to say that I won't at the end of the day, but uh, I really need to process that a little bit. Uh, I think you all know that I've kind of uh, built my political reputation on, on being a low-tax guy, low-tax small government guy, and I, I, I believe in that very deeply. There's a reason why I take the positions that I do. Um, but there, there is a case, I think, that can be made for some enhanced revenues uh, through the gas tax. There's a lot of vehicles on the street today that, that don't use conventional uh, gasoline. And I think, uh, uh, obviously, when we passed that gas tax, those things didn't exist. So I do think there's some adjustments uh, that are going to have to be uh, looked at. Whether I support a 10, 10 cent a gallon gas tax, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not there yet. Uh, but I am open to, to the discussion. And uh, I do support some of the other things that uh, Noel has talked about. The bottom line, though, is that I know as well as anybody in this room what a problem I-17 is and what a problem uh, Highway 69 is. We have to do something about, um, about those clogged uh, commercial arteries because they, they do impact the economic development uh, of, of our area as well as um, inconveniencing our, our citizens. So something has to be done. What exactly we do, I'm not quite sure. I'm hopeful, quite frankly, that, uh, you know, President Trump has talked about um, infrastructure spending, a big spending program. I'm, I'm very hopeful that there'll be some additional funding available to Arizona uh, to fix problems, particularly like um, I-17, I which is a vital commercial uh, corridor for the, for the entire state. I want to tell you just real quickly um, where I ended up on my committee assignments. I'm on three committees. Noel and I are on one committee together. We're both on the federalism and public safety and property rights um, committee. Uh, but I am on the education committee. My, my three top picks 
uh, when I was asked what committees I want to be on were uh, education. This is a, a very deep interest uh, of mine. Uh, judiciary, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I've worked with uh, justice issues uh, most of my life, and uh, I do have some expertise in that area, uh, and, and federalism. And so I sort of got my, my three top uh, picks. Uh, Doug Ducey, I'm sure you all heard the state of the state speech that he gave or have read about it. He's, about half that speech was devoted to educational issues. So I'm going to be very supportive of our governor and what he wants to do. I do support higher pay for our teachers. Um, I do support uh, better funding for our schools. Um, question is, how do we pay for it? And I haven't seen the budget. I think it was released today. I have not yet seen it. It hasn't been, I haven't seen it in the media yet, so I'm hopeful over the weekend there'll be some, there'll be some news on exactly what the particulars are of that budget. But as a general matter, I do plan to support, uh, uh, support, the, uh, support the governor on his education initiatives. I will say that I am a school choice supporter, and Judge, uh, um, Governor Ducey did say that uh, Arizona is going to continue to be a strong school choice state, so I support that as well. The other area I want to touch on is judiciary. Uh, earlier this week, I had an opportunity to uh, meet with the Supreme Court judges. Uh, they had a, a program, Justice for All. Uh, they are looking at ways, as I have been looking at ways, to reduce the jail population. We lock a lot of people up for nonviolent offenses. We have a lot of people that get caught up in the criminal justice system for nonviolent things. They get fines. They get court costs. They don't pay them. Those things turn in, into warrants. We end up spending thousands of dollars to collect a few hundred dollars in fines. So that's one of the areas that the courts wants to, uh, wants to look at. Uh, the other one is holding people on cash bonds. Uh, whenever you lock somebody up and hold them on a bond, uh, that person is out of circulation for a number of days, perhaps for weeks. They lose their job, they lose their uh, house, they can't make their car payment, they can't pay their child support. It starts a whole downward spiral for these people, and the courts uh, are interested in looking at that. So I'm running on here, but those are the areas that I'm going to be focusing on. Thanks. Uh, Senator Fan, you have any additional comments? Yeah, if you want me to go into all the bills now, I will. <laughs> I thought we were doing just hello, here we are. Um, okay, as I said, I have a number of bills that I am running. I don't know why, but I only always end up with a lot of them. Um, I am running three for workman's compensation, two for Department of Economic Security, for unemployment reforms. Um, one of the big bills that I am doing is for the Industrial Commission. And if we can get it through, it will save the state about $20 million. Um, I also have them having the League of Cities and Towns and the county supervisors um, doing some numbers so that we can see how much that's going to save on the municipalities. It deals with directive care um, as far as when a worker gets injured, um, how we treat them, and, and tweaking some of the rules so that we can make sure that we take care of them, they get good, they have great and, and wonderful coverage, but, and they're taken care of, um, but we try and do it in a little more efficient way, which will start saving us some money. So it's a very complicated bill, but we can go into it at another time. I am running a bill for full day kindergarten. Um, I was very surprised, did not know where the governor was gonna be on this, but in his state of the state address, he actually, put a shout out for it, and um, said he supported it in his budget today. I noticed there was a $10 million uh, line item for the um, all day K. We are going to start with the most vulnerable, um, those that um, are in districts where they don't have the opportunity to have parents at home to help homeschool them um, in the afternoon when they get out of half day kindergarten. Um, I will tell you that when I was first elected, if somebody said, do you support all day K, I, w I would have said no. And the reason being is because I kept thinking of what full air kindergarten was when I went to kindergarten. And we now say this is not your mother or your grandmother's kindergarten. Um, these kids are sharp these days. And the days of let's go in and learn how to tie your shoe, take a nap, and have a snack and go out for recess in kindergarten, those are over. These kids are sharp, and it is time. If we expect them to have reading when ready by third grade, they need more in kindergarten. 
and I will also make a point since this is going out. Um, this will be voluntary. We do not want some parents say, I want my kid home the other half day. I don't want them. That's okay. We are going to make this optional so that the parents who think that their kids need the all-day K and the extra teaching and tutoring, it will be there for them. If you are a parent that wants to do some homeschooling or work with your kids on their own, that's okay to do that too. Um, let's see, I am doing an angel tax credit that has to work, do, uh, deal with the Arizona Technology Council. It is an economic development. I work with the chamber on that as well. It's a way of encourage more technology, more jobs. You know me, I'm all about economic development and building what we have here. Uh, let's see, I can't remember all the rest of them. I will tell you a couple that aren't my bills that I am working on. One of them is a <clears throat> legislator over in the House who is a very dear friend, been working with her on all this year. As you know, the TPT construction sales tax is being discussed again. Um, this legislature has some constituents who are, they're in that horrible, I knew this was gonna be a problem, we all knew it was, Larry, you know it was. It's that horrible remodel thing where they don't know whether they're supposed to be remodel or new or used or up or down, and it's created a problem, and it needs to be fixed, but what they're floating around is going back to this point of sales, which I am totally adamantly opposed. Um, they said, oh, well, what we'll do is we'll collect, one of the suggestions is we will collect all the sales tax, it will go in a different budget bucket, and then we'll figure out a shared revenue and divvy it up based on permits being pulled by all the municipalities, um, which I am opposed to. I said, I, under I understand you're trying to come up with solutions, I appreciate it, but here's your first thing. This whole thing started with trying to make tax simpler. And the whole thing was supposed to be because Governor Brewer had people who were what I call not even contractors, but they're service contractors, the Sears repairman, the heating and cooling guy that does, runs around Phoenix and puts in, you know, um, fixes six heaters in a day in six different municipalities. My opinion is they never should have been con classified as contractors anyway. So they sh never should have been under the construction sales tax thing. If we had just fixed that, it would have fixed the problem, but no. We're going off. So here is the problem with this suggestion is in something that's supposed to be simple, now we're gonna create a whole new bureaucracy to figure out how to divvy up this money, number one, number two, so we've now created more government, more costs, more everything else. Number two, I said, ask any municipality how that state shared revenue thing worked out, and I'm gonna tell you everyone is gonna say not so well especially when times get tough. So I don't think the municipalities are gonna like that. And number three, I said once again, rural Arizona will still get the short end of the stick and you will never be able to fix that. And, and of course I gave them a gazillion excuses so, um, or explanations, so I am watching that one like a hawk um, and if they even try and mess with rural Arizona and our cities and towns, I am gonna be all over it. The second thing that I am involved with that's not my bill, um, I got involved because of through a core process that happened just before the holidays, and I found out that the firemen um, union down there are bringing forth two bills that deal with presumption of care. In a nutshell, there, one bill is gonna address cancer, one is gonna address heart attacks. Right now, under workman's compensation, there is a narrow, there's uh, like four or five cancers that are covered under workman's compensation for firemen. They have statistical um, and uh, science, evidence-based medicine, science behind it that says, if firemen get these type of cancers, chances are they got it on the job. So we're gonna cover it. They want to bring a bill that's going to open it up to a whole lot of other cancers. They are also doing a bill right now, pretty much the rule of thumb is, is if you have a heart attack while you're on the job, of course, it's job related. This extends it that even if you're not on the job, 
that if you have it within a certain period of time, um, and I don't remember, I haven't been allowed to look at the bills yet. They're keeping them secret. Um, but apparently there is a period of time afterwards that if they have it, then, well, it must have been job related. My problem in, and what I told them is that, and we're doing these stakeholder meetings, I have the Industrial Commission, Insurance, the League of Cities and Towns, the counties, everybody's involved with this. And um, the problem here in lies is that it's going to shift everything over into workman's compensation. And if you open this up, you think we have a problem with PSPRS now because of unintended consequences? This is what's going to happen with these two bills. If we open this up and shift it over to workman's comp, where now they are able to get years and years and years worth of salary, you know, the 66 and two-thirds only many of them qualify for up to 100%, which could go on for 5, 10, 20 years. Um, besides all the other thing, can you imagine what's going to happen to our EMOD, our risk pool, everything else? So that those are two bills that I am working very closely on and hoping as soon as they actually drop them, then I can start going around and in uh, talking to the other people about why this could be a potential problem. So those are just a few things that we have. I'll stop there. Good. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> and I uh, really appreciate your comments on the TPT. Governor Brewer was a good governor, but she really opened a can of worms when she introduced that. Her argument was that it's a contractor's uh, nightmare and an accountant's dream, I guess. Uh, she's totally wrong. I, I've done thousands of tax returns over the years. And it was a fairly simple thing, a little bit of housekeeping, but it did not need the, uh, all the stupid stuff she tried to bring into it. So I'm glad you're on top of that. Anyone else have any comments before we uh, get serious? Uh, Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to agree with you as well. And I remember, I think we're paying like 80 to close to $90,000 a year to support that bureaucracy for TPT. And, and uh, you know, I, I think it's just a slap in the face when they take that funding away and then they're dealing with how do we address that, yet we have to pay for the bureaucracy for them to kind of figure that out. So it's an interesting process. And of course we do want our uh, revenue sharing protected. Uh, always, nothing's changed. The uh, city, 80% of the people live in municipalities, cities, towns. 90% of their revenues come out of cities and towns. And, uh, of course, we have uh, right here in Prescott Valley in uh, about 38 or 40 square miles, we have 240 miles of roads and streets to maintain. We need those funds. And I, I don't think the state wants to take that over. We don't want the state to take it over. We want you to run the state business. Let us run our municipal business. Any other comments, anyone? If not, then let's move on to the uh, number three. Development impact fees. And Richard, I guess you were going to make some comments there. Everybody knows Mr. Parker, I think it. Yeah, hi, guys. Um, I drew the short straw uh, to talk uh, to you about development impact fees. And I was intrigued to, to hear some of your comments. And, and with all due respect, Mayor, Council, um, Representatives, and uh, Senator, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about uh, a response to your comment about big government and the consequences of some of the actions that you take perhaps unintended consequences that you don't think about. And we would very much you, encourage you, I so much appreciate the efforts that you've made, Karen, in, in your time, and Noel, and look forward to meeting you, sir, and, and doing business with you, and talk about the, the real impacts. And one of them that uh, came to my mind when Larry asked for topics was development impact fees. And as you know, a few years ago, uh, the town of Prescott Valley and, and the city of Prescott uh, through incentive uh, and actually through policy elected not to charge development impact fees to commercial entities. And that was done purposely because commercial entities are what drive our economy here. We live and die by sales tax revenue. Prescott Valley does not have a property tax, probably never will. With that in mind, uh, we found it valuable to try to entice uh, because our uh, competitors to the West were trying to entice the same kind of commercial development. Well, the Home Builders Association took us to court and said there's no reason uh, why uh, this should be ongoing, and they lost. 
and when that case was appealed, they lost again. So then it uh, went up to the state legislature, and Karen, I think you were in it at the time, and the state intended to close that loophole and, and make it more uniform. And then I think they lost their mind because they started to overreach, and I use that term because that was one of the support or the justifications for the bill that was ultimately passed in 2011. And that bill uh, was directed at, I believe, Mesa and some of the larger communities that had established cultural fees and things like that and had gone out and built a big performance uh, facility, which is quite grand and extraordinary, but it was uh, brought uh, to the legislature that that wasn't fair because not everybody got to enjoy that facility. <clears throat> they didn't stop there. They continued and they further then limited uh, smaller communities to do what we were doing, and I thought doing reasonably, and that is devoting money to civic uh, facilities, such as our civic center, uh, to libraries. Uh, of course, the library was a big deal, and they imposed restrictions on libraries. Fortunately, we had this library constructed before that happened, so we'll be able to continue to apply those to our indebtedness on this building until that sun sets. The other things that they didn't think through as well is they uh, shortened the length of time that a small municipality or any municipality has to expend those funds on capital improvements. And we build a lot of houses in Prescott Valley. Uh, during the recession, we didn't build a lot of houses in Prescott Valley. <clears throat> but uh, when you're building a capital improvement plan, you build that plan over 10 or 15 years so you can undertake things like adding lane width to Glassford Hill Road, uh, which is the intention of the road impact fee. Add municipal f facilities to the police department, which would have been a civic uh, endeavor. But small municipalities don't have the ability to devote those very large chunks of change to a capital improvement plan that has a duration of only five years. So what you see is those projects broken into very small segments. And Karen can very much understand because of the business she and her brother have been in, the cost of remobilizing every time you do something has a consequence as to your ability to achieve that project. So you go out and you do a short segment and you pull back and you wait until there's money available. Or you do a half a park, which we've been really good at as a municipality, being very efficient, doing uh, with uh, what we have uh, within our means to be able to accomplish things that we want to accomplish. Larry uh, was really good before the recession. We stopped all our, our capital improvements because things got tight and he saw it coming, which was a good deal. But my point is well-intended actions that, that you believe may apply uniformly across municipalities really can sting a small municipality like the town of Prescott Valley that doesn't have the wherewithal to take on those very large capital improvements without some other tools like development impact fees. They certainly are not going to come out of general funds, um, though we're blessed because we've been very, or they've been very frugal in, in the way they manage uh, their funds here in government. But that's one of uh, very few in the state of Arizona, and it really stings. So as an example, our five-year plans now are very short segmented plans to be able to undertake something that should be something you would say for for 10 or 15 years to do that improvement to benefit the community. And some of the things that uh, were maybe well intended but I don't believe uh, thought through well um, were included in that bill. Brings me to my main point and Karen you talked about You've been running a lot of bills, and I do appreciate that you're really busy. You see something that says development impact fees on it, I would hope that you'd call Larry or pick up the phone and call the mayor and make sure that we understand what's going on, very similar to the, the discussion about construction taxes. I, too, again, look forward to, to meeting you, uh, Representative Stringer, um, and so you understand the consequences of those bills. In the case of the development impact fees, fortunately government, uh, Governor Brewer, near the end of her term, said, I'm not going to look at any more bills. So pressure was off. We went and did other good things for this community as opposed to worry about what would come out of the state legislature. But again, with all sincerity, if you see something regarding 
uh, development impact fees. We talked about construction, sales tax. Those are hot buttons, and we'd like to hear from you because they are of significant consequences to this small municipality. Uh, I've worked here now 20 years. Never thought it would be that long. Never thought it would be so much fun, but never would, under, would have understood the consequences of some um, simple um, actions by the state legislature to make things better. They make it that much more difficult to administer small municipal governments. Questions, thoughts? Questions. Are you aware of anything coming down with development impact fees? Thankfully not. I, I have not heard anything at all on it now. That's not to say that um, everybody, you know, there's still a lot of bills to be dropped and uh, we don't know what all is going to be coming, so I will keep my eyes out on it. One thing I will mention is uh, and it's not just the development impact fees, but it's so many other things. And I think Representative Campbell has had to deal with this in his first two years, and, and Representative Stringer is, is going to learn very quickly um, that we support our cities and towns, obviously rural Arizona a lot, and probably more me more so than other legislators just because of being a, a mayor and a council person for 11 years. Um, so I totally understand this side. I think one of the toughest, you know, when I went down there, I was like going, oh, yeah, I'm all about local control, local control, and I still am. But it's, may, it's very hard. Some of these municipalities are making it really hard to stand up and fight for local control. When you have a municipality that says we're going to establish our own minimum wage and benefits yeah. and that all of us can you imagine as the state of arizona if we had 91 cities and towns with different minimum wages and benefits it, we couldn't do it um it, municipalities that say that you know they're going to it's a moot issue now because it was a few years ago. Schools. We're going to recognize gay marriages. Well, that's not a municipality's. You have a municipality in the Phoenix area that wants to regulate electricity and energy use of all the businesses to make sure they're not using too much energy. <laughs> it's it's getting and and let's go to these impact fee things because um, yeah we've used impact fees in Prescott and Chino Valley that's how we're building our towns right um, but we've got municipalities as you said in the Phoenix area and they are charging these ridiculous fees to build these Taj Mahal things in very elite neighborhoods where nobody else will get to enjoy them. They are collecting money on parks that they want to build that are literally uh, Buckeye was the uh, was the example, I believe, because it's like very long and narrow. It's like 20 miles long. The park is like 20 miles away and they're charging all the people impact fees on the 20 miles away. They'll never use it. So I totally understand what you're saying. I am totally in your court. I just want to mention that it's, it's getting very difficult to, to fight for local control when we have some municipalities that are kind of going off the deep end. And I understand that completely, and, and with all due respect, I think that there could have been uh, other ways to handle what the end game was and that is limit the expenditure on this type of use so you wouldn't build the Taj Mahal. Um, continue to let smaller municipalities amass capital dollars over a long period of time to be able to take on the capital improvements that they need to take on because they're not generating the capital as quickly as the large municipalities. An example of that is the state legislature when, when uh, they refined Growing Smarter over three sessions uh, set forth certain planning elements that have to take place in in the very large uh, planning areas and then the others are permissible that you can do it you're not obligated to do this level but if you choose to do so you can you can do a lesser level or you can go all the way up to the top and I think that would have been a better menu approach to that situation prof professionally from my view um, so again well intended but I don't don't think that they th they thought it all the way through, they agreed it was a snake and they needed to cut the head off and they cut the head off and we're the ones that are suffering as a result. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. By the way, Karen, we do appreciate your comments and I, I think it's appropriate to say that 
you've been an outstanding legislator for many, many years. Appreciate that uh, Representative Cam Campbell has been able to benefit from your experience. Now Stringer will benefit through uh, Campbell, and uh, it's good, good uh, working. You, uh, I think we're very fortunate right now to have you three in, in, a, in a capital fighting not only on behalf of the state, but on behalf of the municipality. So keep up the good work. Before we move on to the next uh, topic, any of the council have any questions, comments? Larry, did you have a comment? No. Council have any? Okay, <clears throat> if there's no further comment, we'll move on to the next one, which is another favorite subject, state shared revenue. Larry, you have any comments on that? Yeah, so, uh, first off, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for taking the time out. Uh, Karen, congratulations on your move over to the Senate. Uh, you have been a, uh, an advocate for uh, uh, rural Arizona. And uh, Noel, David, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your service. Thank you for wanting to go ahead and serve the community. Uh, state shared revenues, this is real, real short and sweet. Leave them alone. Okay, it's that simple. Leave them alone. This isn't a gift that the state is giving cities and towns. This is memorialized in legislation passed in the 60s, and every year they are under assault. Every year. And to be real honest with you guys, and, and uh, I'm going to say something that may not go over well, but it's like, oh, no, the state legislature's back in session <laughs> because we have to defend ourselves. That's wrong. I shouldn't feel like I am now in defense mode from now until May or God help you, June. Uh, we shouldn't have to do that. And, and I w uh, with all due respect, what business is it of the state if the town of Prescott Valley wants to have plastic bags, we want to go ahead and have a minimum wage higher than the city? What business is it of the state's? It's none. Okay, you, I, I would, okay, we, we could argue on this, Karen, but if you have cities or towns in the state of Arizona that want to do wild and crazy things, they should not end up incurring the wrath of the state withholding state shared revenues. I completely disagree with that piece of legislation that went through and, and govern, uh, governor's insistence that somehow or other the state has the right to punish cities and towns by withholding something that was granted by ARSs back in the 60s. A, a, a punitive approach from the state government, whether it's withholding state shared revenues or taking percentages of them away when times are tough, quite frankly, guys, that's, I believe it's an overreach. And if you have a, a city and town that wants to charge or, or uh, have a higher minimum wage, have at it, folks, because those businesses are going to come to Prescott Valley where we're business friendly. And if they want to do wacky things with development impact fees, go right ahead. They'll come to Prescott Valley, to communities that are well run and have great elected officials that don't want to do anything but encourage business. So I, I would really encourage you to avoid the overreach uh, and avoid any attempt at uh, doing anything with state shared revenues. Uh, we've got a great state and we're going to move forward and, and please focus on those important things that are state responsibilities like we were talking earlier, uh, highway safety, highway funding, very important, and education. So with that, I'll show Larry, you. thanks for your comments. That, uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, bill that Larry is referring to was called SB 1487. Is that right, Karen? I think it's Senate Bill 1487 that Larry's talking about where uh, they, they can do this. The I don't remember can, the number, but I know exactly what he's talking about. The legislators can do some stupid things. I think that should be reversed and make something, do something, you know, get, get them to do something intelligent. That kind of nonsense is absolutely idiotic. Larry is right. Uh, Vice Mayor? Well, just to give you a good example, I own a small business. If every time the legislature did something stupid and I refused to send them my tax money that I've collected, 
I'll bet you wouldn't appreciate that. On the other hand, we can't do a damn thing about the money that you refuse to give back to us that's our money to begin with. So I just don't think that's fair. I don't think anybody thinks that fair. I don't think anybody in their right mind can justify doing that. Not with a straight face. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, anyone? Okay, let's, uh, if not, let's move on to uh, number five, discussion, her funding. Norm? Good evening, Mayor Council, Representative Fan. Rep I'm sorry, Senator Fan. I'm, I'm not getting used to it either. Representative Campbell, Representative Stringer, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about her fund, but I'm going to basically talk to you about transportation tonight. I'm the transportation guy in Prescott Valley, uh, Norm Davis. I'm the public works director. Um, talk to you every year for the last bunch of years about transportation funding. Same game. We've all worked hard. We've been through the tough times, the Great Recession. I don't think it was appropriate to say we should increase funding. I guess I couldn't be happier to hear your introduction, Representative Campbell, um, being the transportation chairman. You hit on every one of my points. Uh, you get it. Um, couldn't be happier with knowing the, the highlights. It, we, we need to benchmark the funding. What I did want to do was uh, cap maybe just a couple comments. I know you wouldn't have full comments, but just wanted to emphasize the fact, hasn't been benchmarked since 1993. We only got half the funding we used to have in 93. If we did the same things we did 25 years ago. What's, what's more important too, I think, uh, and you touched upon it, uh, Representative Stringer, is that uh, better fuel efficiency. It's not the same since 1993. We've got electric cars. We've got cars that get 30 to 40 miles per gallon. So that same revenue source uh, isn't going to make it. So I, was, I think the, the 10 cents per gallon, I think it's wonderful that, that you're making a run at it because we've been advocating that for years. Over the last uh, 10 years, I've been here to Prescott Valley. Uh, there's been numerous um, efforts by the associate general contractors, legislatures, and uh, we've just always come up short. And uh, it is time to try again. We're in better times. I do understand the governor's... Um, you know, current looking up mostly at education, that's a good thing. But we also need to look at transportation. I know the, nationally the new presidential um, administration is looking at transportation infrastructure. It's important. Let's look at nationally what's happening. Uh, let's take some a look at our, of our local roads. I-40 in the last year was almost impassable. I talked, I've talked in the past about that cliff that if you don't fund adequately maintenance, you hit that cliff and then you're, you're too far behind. Right in your district here, Hell's Canyon Bridge, the bridge deck fell down. Um, it, now it's time to fix it. The engineers know. We've been telling them for years, trying to advocate for more maintenance dollars. That's the dire straits we're in. Our infrastructure is actually failing now, and we're having to pay. We're, we're not doing anything preventative. We're losing that, basically, that investment in our infrastructure. So loud and clear, you've heard it. Uh, thank you. You're right on target with it. Let me talk about another thing. So one thing I do want to do, you have worked hard. I uh, do want to say thank you because... Uh, we got word as rural local governments that this past June, we got $30 million extra dollars this year that was distributed because of good times. And I'm glad it was recognized by the legislature. We've, um, as uh, transportation maintenance officials, uh, always had concern about the diversion of HERF dollars to DPS. I was glad that last year uh, they didn't want to particularly cut the funding, but they actually uh, kept that diversion down to what was statutorily um, approved. So another good year. Let's keep that her funding uh, being returned to the rule because I know people just like me everywhere and that work in the business of road maintenance, we will put it back directly into roadway maintenance. So, uh, Representative Cam, I did want to comment too uh, about transportation. The lottery funds, I was glad that I heard you mention it. I didn't have it initially, but my understanding was the lottery funds before they took them is what funded our local LTAF and our transit vouchers. Uh, very much a demise here, uh, here locally. Uh, Prescott Valley is the only community that continued on with the transit vouchers. And so with the loss of the funding, I remember when I gave the presentation to council, I think it was about four years ago, when the legislature, you know, we used the term buckets, well, they took that LTAF bucket and actually uh, dumped it. They took it away. It wasn't like it wasn't being filled. They, they took it away. So I'm glad you're working on that. What do we do here locally with our LTAF 2 funds from the lottery? We put it right in our transit vouchers. And we'd like to sustain that funding, and the, our Prescott Valley Council has recognized the need that serves the transit-dependent community, the people that don't have a vehicle and need to get the basic services. So our council has taken it upon themselves, and when the bucket was taken away, and it was typically a 25%, 75% LTAF with 25% local match, 
they kept that $50,000 minimum funding level right coming out of our general fund so that we could maintain that transportation to the transit dependent community. Those are the people that have to qualify through NACO. It's not the people that have an ability to get there. It's a very good uh, use of that particular funding to get the people that need to get the basic services, doctor's appointments, that one or two rise that keeps them from being homebound and not being able to get to their destination whatsoever. So I'm glad you're advocating for that particular ability. One other thing that has been local I just wanted to mention is there's been a lot of play since June of the Transportation Funding Tax Force. I, I think um, if I have my notes right, it was Senate Bill 1490. So I haven't read a lot on that, but I know there's been a lot of effort in order to look at it statewide, get some more funding to the rural areas. So I hope that one gets the focus and we continue to look at transportation in these better times and improving our infrastructure. One thing I did want to, um, I guess, call attention our uh, local Prescott Valley Council They've recognized the need for enhanced maintenance dollars. Uh, basically, this time last year, I did lots of presentations with the same data you've had about uh, loss of funding and the need for it. But uh, this time last year, we put a half-cent sales tax locally in Prescott Valley for maintenance. Now, the half-cent sales tax generates generally $3 million. $2 million a year was dedicated right for maintenance. Our council here has recognized the needs. The people of Prescott Valley recognize the need for maintenance. So if you're down in your particular chambers, talking about what are the local people doing besides just complaining. We've always funded transportation here in this area. The half cent sales tax has gone to a lodge of the regional roads area we've been working on. That was put in by Yalpai County in about 93, if I recall, since the early 90s. So here in Prescott Valley, it wasn't a capital improvement tax and sales tax. It was for maintenance only. We put that into play, and that $2 million a year is going right here in Prescott Valley for enhanced street maintenance. We have an increased maintenance program mostly chip sale at this point, but every little bit of enhanced funding gets that service level up for our particular roadways. Those are my comments on her funding. We'd like to touch on just a couple other things, and I'm glad you spoke about it. Representative Stringer was I-17 widening. It's drastically needed. We all, we all know the need. I'm, I'm glad you brought up in your opening comments. I don't need to say much more. Uh, I have seen the particular um, proposed uh, preliminary design they had a real nice, uh, at one of our transportation meetings about, I've even shown the middle lane, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, you're nodding your hands, yes. Um, very good, it's uh, not a complicated design. We have the right of way. I'd like to think the timeline is not long, probably some environmental work if we use any type of federal funds, but if the right of way is there, I know funding is always a problem, but uh, it's a big problem. To have us, I know it's routinely, I'm sure we know, we're not able to get to the uh, metropolitan area, nor are they able to get through here. It links two major interstates, don't need to tell you that. Uh, it's a significant corridor, and have it shut down as often and frequently as it is, um, I think it's really a need, and I hope you continue to, to advocate for that particular project. <laughs> Last comment I did have about uh, transportation that concerned me a little bit. Just came the, uh, here um, uh, to us local uh, is the, I understand there's a bill that the current thresholds for maintenance by a municipality is going to be challenged by the Associated General Contractors. It's now currently around 200,000, and they want to drop it down to, I think, as low as 50,000. So I don't know the genesis of why the Associated General Contractors feels like the current methodology we have. I don't know the genesis, because obviously here in Prescott Valley, we outsource as much as we can. But a lot of that basic maintenance, I don't know. I just hope when we talk about legislation that's not smart, so to speak, um, I hope some of the constraints and overreaching doesn't get to be difficult in that uh, if your county and you're blading roads, does a contractor really want to do that? Patching potholes is hard to scope, you know, edge patching, shoulder backing. I hope that um, I'd like to get back to who's really the culprit and find out and direct that rather than pass a far-reaching law that really impacts how we maintain roads that I don't think would be really good to, the, to our taxpayer or the inefficiencies I think that could bring. So. We always outsource and hire out for capital improvements and much of our maintenance. Here in Prescott Valley, our million dollar chip seal program every year is always outsourced by contractor. Even uh, what's important to point out this year, in order to meet the demand of our uh, extra $2 million of maintenance, we actually outsourced about two thirds of that particular endeavor. A contracting community, we were able to identify scopes and areas. They came out and did our edge patching for us. So we do go and have the, and, and we do, uh, they've got the workmanship, the equipment, and then uh, we don't have to have an inventory. So I just uh, caution you to take a hard look at that, Senator Fan. I'd like you to look at that one and see exactly what the genesis was and make sure that uh, we don't get inefficient and be able to do the maintenance needs that we have in our, de 
uh, particular maintenance needs here in municipalities. With that, those are my comments. Be happy to answer any questions or take comments. I just, I, I want to do, I appreciate your comments, and, and I assure you, uh, I recognize the, the funding issue. I'm going to support Noel uh, as much as I can in terms of enhancing uh, funding. But with respect to the gas tax, I have not bought off on that uh, yet. I'm still processing that. So my question to you is, do you think there is an appetite here in Prescott Valley for the voters? Because I think this would go to the voters. Isn't that right, No, Absolutely, it would go to the voters. Do you think there's an appetite here in Prescott Valley, among Prescott Valley voters, to increase their gas tax by 10 percent? And I'm just, I don't would think appreciate, it was, would appreciate hearing your, your, your views on that. I don't think it was 10 percent. I think it was 10 cents. That'd be what, two and a I'm half cents? I'm sorry, I, mis I misspoke no, 10 cents. I think there's two and a half cents a year. Did I understand it right? For the next four yeah. years? The, uh, yeah. Use your uh, microphone if yeah. you would. <laughs> the, uh, it'd be over a four-year period to go from uh, eight, 18 cents a gallon to 28 cents a gallon. But uh, I just want to quickly say that th this proposal is to get us moving. To uh, There have been no proposals about raising revenue. And so how far this goes depends on the League of Cities and Towns, the County Association of Supervisors, the City Councils. We all have to come forward together to educate the, the people of our communities of the needs that we have. Uh, me, Representative Campbell, pushing a bill for a 10, 10 cent increase isn't going to go anyplace, but it will definitely get the conversation going. And another, I, I'll tell you another thing that will get the conversation going, and I've already uh, discussed it with uh, Senator Fan is I am going to drop a bill this week that is going to permanently fund the Department of Public Safety because the Department of Public Safety takes about $130 million a year out of the HERF fund, okay? So we need a permanent source of revenue to, to uh, take care of uh, DPS. The governor two years ago in his first budget had a proposal to do that. My proposal is simple and, and straightforward and does not require voter approval, although it will require two-thirds of each house to approve it. And my proposal is, is that when a person renews his auto insurance on a yearly basis, a, an additional $30 will be charged. And that will be, be, be collected by the Department of Insurance. And every car in the state, no matter how efficient or un not efficient, how big, how small, it's simple. When you start trying to break cars up by um, whether they're, they're hybrids or electrics, you get, really get into a documentation problem. Now, maybe this won't go very far, but it is a proposal. It is a starting point. We need to start talking about it legislatively uh, to how do we raise some revenue to get more money into HERF, because if we can take DPS out of the HERF stream, we keep more money in, into our roads and constructions. Um, and uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, there's going to be good thoughts about it, good amendments, hopefully, but it will be discussed. And that's, that's all I can do at this point, because nobody else is bringing it up. And, and we need to start pushing it and talking about it. We, I don't think we can wait two more years, although we may have to. And I know, I know how the governor feels, but we need to educate our people. Listen, there isn't a person that doesn't drive Highway 69 between Prescott and Prescott Valley that doesn't cuss his brains out like I do. <laughs> because you know how it narrows and the backlogs? I mean, we have real transportation needs here. And we have to be honest with ourselves, and, and that's what government is really for, to do necessary things. Transportation is essential. I'll get off my high horse now. I was just going to answer your question about what was the genesis behind that bill um, that the AGC is looking to drop. Um, this is one of those situations where communities, wonderful communities like Prescott Valley, who do it right, um, end up... Um, getting drug into things like this. Um, the genesis behind it is there are some very large municipalities in Arizona who like to build bigger and bigger and bigger governments. And so they are building these regimes. They are buying a lot of heavy equipment, paving machines, hiring a lot of people on very large salaries and municipal benefits. And so consequently, um, it's the old, uh, you know, the monster just keeps getting bigger. 
And what happens is in those cases is usually it's the taxpayers that take it in the shorts because they can't be as efficient as private enterprise can. So consequently, for them to do a job, uh, many times it is costing the ta taxpayers twice as much um, rather than letting it go out to the bid system. And that's the genesis behind that is don't let these municipalities grow their regimes and uh, don't make the taxpayers pay twice as much as they should. If I could, Rep uh, Senator Fan, I would like to say, then I would like to suggest they go after the large, especially the large ones, where $200,000 threshold, yeah, absolutely, that's not very much money for a large municipality. I hope they go after them more than pass, of, as we talk, far-reaching legislation that would affect Prescott Valley. Go directly to the source and say, guys, it's a $200,000 limit. You are very big. Uh, go after them and um, make sure that they uh, comply with the law. Should be. If, if I could, I just wanted to comment, uh, Representative Stringer mentioned, uh, do you think Prescott Valley would um, vote for a tax like that? I guess um, we've had the half cent sales tax here locally in place, and the feedback has, I'd like to think, uh, been very, very well received. Is absolutely, our streets, that's why the council put it in the place and voted, was because they listened to their constituents and said, we need more road maintenance, more money for road maintenance. It's not done at the federal level. The state's having difficulties. We're going to take care of our roadways here so we don't lose that investment we have in the pavement. So just another couple comments. You know, Arizona's 45th in the nation for gas tax. So there's many more ahead of us. And uh, one other from my research uh, from the um, facts is that since uh, 2013, half the states have passed transportation funding increases. That's why I think you see Arizona is um, number 45 and uh, at where it's at. So I think it, 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 it would be reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura? Uh, in regards to the tax question, um, I don't want to disagree with Norm because I do think our general population supported us. But there's a reason why they supported us. Those tax dollars were totally designated and we were very clear to our citizens exactly where it was going to go. They even knew the departments it was going to go to and how it was going to be spent. And I do think the dialogue has to begin. So I applaud you for the hits that you're going to take <laughs> for, for starting the dialogue. But we can't just go... We, we should not just go out there and propose an increase without stating what those funds are going to be dedicated to because you'll find, you'll just find resistance everywhere. Now that's going to be really difficult. I don't even know if that's possible, but we just had a firsthand experience. We know how they react. So please, when you're proposing, do something besides propose an increase. Give some qualitative information about how you're going to best utilize that increase. And you'll have a larger representative who will not just listen to you, but will say, you know, we probably should do that. So I, I just really want you to be cautious about that because it's it's going to be terrible. And um, I'll give you a hug every time I see you. You're <laughs> going to earn it. But Marty? And, and oh, I sorry. have a question for you. Um, I did not know until I got here tonight and saw the agenda. It's my fault. I didn't look at the agenda before that there was no opportunity for us to ask them questions that was not on the agenda. I do have a question at the appropriate time that I want to address that's not on the agenda, and I'd be surprised if others didn't as well. I think we'd, uh, that'd be a very appropriate, probably uh, right after. Uh, right, let's finish uh, the agenda. Okay, Marty. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding the, uh, the 10 cent gas tax, Two weeks ago, I filled up my gas tank, and last week I filled up my gas tank, and there was a 10 cents a gallon difference. 
gas prices are continuously fluctuating up and down. Uh, comes the summer, the gas price is going to go up 20, 30 cents because it's the summertime and we expect it or people expect it and it just automatically happens. And it all varies because of the, uh, you know, what, what oil costs per gallon, you know, per barrel. Uh, to add a 10 cent gas tax would not even be seen or, you know, understood by anybody. I mean, it would be, it would be accepted and they wouldn't even question it. Uh, so, you know, raising it a small amount, such as 10 cents a gallon, would not hurt a lot of people. And uh, like I said, the gas, the, you know, the gas prices are constantly f fluctuating. You know, if you just go up Robert Road, up and down Robert Road, you'll see gas prices, you know, for regular will be anywhere from 209 to 249. And people, you know, people are at the pump paying all those prices. So uh, 10 cents a gallon is not going to be a big deal. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. Should we do that at the end? Or at the end? Okay. Yeah. We're going to let Dan speak at the end. Right? Yeah, I am. I intend to, huh? Any uh, other council comments? Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to lend my 10 cents worth of uh, comment. But I, I do, t I think it is a good time. I think timing is, is good. I think it is a, a, a strategy to begin the discussion, you know, the conversation. And, you know, I, I think it would be accepted uh, only because I think we're witnessing in our community and on the state and, and uh, federal highways the, uh, the need for, for upgrade. And I've heard, I know when we, we raised our sales tax, there's some people that said they'd be more than happy to drive through a round pothole, so, so be it. But I think it is a, a good time to discuss that and definitely support it. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments? I think, uh, you know, it's, it's just justified. Well, uh, and of course, we, here in Prescott Valley, we saw our roads go from dirt roads with the uh, control at the end of that dirt road was a simple $100 stop sign. Today, they're all blacktop, sometimes divided. Uh, and that control at the end is a one-third to two-third million dollar signal light, as opposed to a hundred dollars. So th there is justification. And I, I believe that uh, there's not even much choice. You're going to have to do it if you want to get the revenues to do the job to keep these roads up. Any other comments? Mary? Um yeah, you know, I just, I just wanted to say that, you know, I can appreciate um, your comment in regards to uh, driving on the road, Representative Campbell, because I often wonder, because I get very frustrated, so I often wonder, am I the only person that realizes these roads are a disaster? So it's very nice to hear you say that. I don't feel so alone. And um, the thing about, I think, that a lot of this state needs to recognize is that there isn't one person in this room right now that isn't invested into our great state of Arizona. Whether it's a business, a house, whatever it may be, we all have an investment into this state. And because of that, that alone is a reason to keep our roads and our infrastructure up to date and ahead as we want to bring businesses, we want to capture businesses and bring them in from other areas, we've got to provide that transportation. And being that I work at a store that needs its produce up I-17, I cannot tell you how many times that truck did not arrive for 12 hours later. And uh, so we've grown up here in our area and we will continue to grow. And so the investment is huge up here and, uh, and I think that that alone should speak volumes to everyone who moves to the great state of Arizona, that we are all invested and we need to protect our investment. Good. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Vice Mayor, you got a comment? I wasn't going to. Couldn't resist, though, could you? Couldn't resist. I'm, I, I'm afraid I'm going to be the wet blanket up here. No, no. Um, You know, I, I can afford over four years, 10 cents a gallon increase in, say, in gasoline tax. And I, I understand gasoline tax hasn't been raised for hundreds of years, and it needs to be. Um, education needs funding. Police and fire department retirement needs funding. Somewhere we've got to start getting this money. 
And that's going to be the key to all of this. You know, we, I, we can sit here and justify right off the, well, there were three, but there's probably a dozen things right now tonight that we can identify that need increased funding in the state of Arizona. But we don't have the money to do those things. And that's your challenge. Find that money. It's not our challenge. We don't have to do that. That's one of the things we don't have to do. And even our citizens don't expect us to be the ones that fix that. They expect you to be the ones that fix that. Uh, I don't expect that fixed, but I expect you to work on it. And I know how hard that is to make everybody happy because you can't do that. Uh, and I know how hard each and every one of you work and will work at making those things happen. Um, but what doesn't happen many times is any action. It seems like the activities are so hard that it's easier to do nothing than it is to try. And I, I think what we're hoping for is that Maybe this is the year that we, we try. And if we can help you, if we can suggest something, if we can do something, if we can be part of making this activity happen, then I know for my part, I, I would be happy to do that, whatever my small part might be. Uh, because we have to start making something happen. Because if we just accept the fact that we can't afford it, well, we, why even bother talking about it? You know, we might as well just turn off the lights and go home because we'll never get anything done. But there's so much that needs to be done and so much of it, so much of it is, is admirable work. So much of it is necessary. So much of it's safety related. You know, um, whether it's public safety or driving safety or safety for our children in schools. Um, we have to do something about this, but we have to, to find ways of making it happen. And we're not gonna get everything we want out of any one particular area, but we've got to start working on it. And, and that's what I'd like to see happen. Thank you. Either one of you wanna start. I'd like to uh, bring up uh, our school, Superintendent Streeter too, but legislators, any one of you three have something to say? How about that, Mr. Streeter? You wanna make some comments? But you'd have to use the microphone. Okay, let's let's do that first. Okay, we go on to number six. Then discussion: Public Safety Personnel Retirement System (PSPRS). Chief, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council staff, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight to our legislators. Thank you very much for the time driving up driving across however you got here and, and the time that you're gonna spend with us this evening. If I can comment on two things before I get to my point or points that have already been stated and uh, Vice Mayor Anderson, you just kind of made the connection a little bit. A lot of things that we talk about tonight come back to safety. And so from the perspective of education, there is a direct correlation between a well-educated public and, and the safety of that public. So anything that we invest in our education and our children from that perspective is gonna make our job easier but our community is safer. Um, and then also from uh, the perspective of Representative Stringer's question about support for a 10 cent sales tax, or excuse me, a 10 cent increase in the gas tax for uh, the HERF fund. I think that there's a correlation there as well between that fund and, and safety on our roadways, which again, maybe that has a positive effect on our need for more police. Maybe we don't need as many if the roadways are better designed, better maintained, and there's less crashes, and less cops are needed to shut down I-17 for hours at a time. So I think it's important to remember that the, the money that we spend on this, it's got other effects as well. What I'm here to talk to you about tonight is a, is a issue of concern to our police department, but I really think to police departments across our state. And at the end, I'll kind of make that connection but of all the factors that make our mission successful in providing a safe environment to our public, the, the one most important aspect is leadership. 
And as a police department, the one most important leader is our chief. And having a chief who is an effective leader is incredibly important. One might define the components of effective leadership as a combination of character, experience, education, and the fit of that individual to the organization. For that reason, the ability of a town to develop those who will potentially fill that position is of utmost importance. We spend considerable resources in training, coaching, and mentoring our staff with the sole purpose of preparing them to lead our organization. Therefore, it's logical to assume that if we do that well, that this staff development might result in the next chief of police coming from within our organization, which is certainly our goal. There are times to admit when bringing in a chief from the outside might be necessary, but that should be the exception. In most circumstances, there are well-qualified candidates from within the organization who can take that post and keep the ship moving in the right direction. Unfortun unfortunately, certain rules within the public safety personnel retirement system make it difficult to sustain leadership growth to the position of chief. Here's the problem. Current rules require an internal candidate to have one year of separation from the agency if they leave the retirement system. And agencies who hire a chief of police who's not part of the system are required to pay an alternative contribution rate for that chief even if they're not part of the system. The way the system is currently configured, we are in essence developing our staff so that they can go elsewhere. In practice, this means that a potential candidate from within the agency who might be three years into the drop program that promotes to chief is gonna have to leave after two years and that's certainly not effective for leadership succession. It also means that individuals who take the position of chief of police must accept that their potential for a further contribution to their retirement is limited to their term as chief of police, which can be somewhat uncertain. Chief's positions are traditionally understood to be at will, serving at the discretion of the town manager and or council. Additionally, the chief might be asked to leave due to circumstances beyond his or her control, like a change in leadership within either or both the council or town administration. For these reasons, it's our belief that these statutes should be constructed so that local jurisdictions have control over the tenure of their chiefs by removing the return to work requirements from the agency head positions only. This would allow the local jurisdiction, jurisdictions control over the benefits provided to a very specialized public safety position, the agency head. We understand the integrity of the retirement system requires as many contributors as possible, but allowing the 90 or so municipalities in our state the ability to plan for leadership succession would not have a meaningful impact on the fund. The meaningful impact is that we are currently forcing good police chiefs to retire early, or people who are potentially the best candidates choose not to pursue the position in the first place. In preparing this presentation, I reached out to several of my peers throughout the state and heard the exact scenario that I just gave occurred in a municipality in Southern Arizona. A chief of police came from within the organization and was only able to remain at that position for one year because he was four years into the draw program and there was no other alternative after that five-year period had run. This also occurred recently in the city of Phoenix when Daniel Garcia left. The internal candidate that was appointed was only able to stay for a year or so before he had to leave as well. This practice creates a financial as well as leadership burden because the city now has to go through the arduous process of seeking another chief of police a process that is expensive and can take up to a year to accomplish. To fix this problem, we recommend a simple change to the statute that would allow local control over the retirement benefit decisions for police department agency heads. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions or comments, I questions, would Questions, anyone? Comments? Uh, Deputy Chief, I'm gonna make some comments that uh, don't directly talk about uh, chiefs and uh, the drop and the efficiency of that. Mm. Um, my answer to your question would be that uh, the uh, police officers unions and the firefighters unions have not come to us this year with any proposals uh, concerning that issue you've discussed. However, a year ago, uh, prior to po uh, passage of Prop 124, I worked on that issue, the retirement issue for a year. And I know Representative Fan 
was chosen to lead the House effort to review the retirement system. And uh, through internal politics, uh, she was not the leader of that effort, but she paid close attention to it. And so what I want to address to you and to the City Council is this. Prop 124 has, has basically tried to cap the well. And, and we have pretty much capped the well, but we have a huge oil mess around that well that's going to take 30 years to clean up. And that's the Tier 1, the Tier 2, and the Tier 2B retirees, the retirees and the present workers. They're under a defined benefits program, and uh, through many reasons, the fund to pay these officers has gone from 100% down to, what, 46% today. And so one of the fixes of Prop 124 was how to relieve the taxpayer of the burden of the pension retirement system. And one of the ways that they came up with was the new hires, the Tier 3 hires, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. So if you're going to hire a police officer or a firefighter, it is best for the taxpayer and the liability that accrues for that pension over 30 or 40 years is if you hire him after the 1st of July 2017. Because after the 1st of July 2017, they come under a defined contribution portion and a defined, a smaller defined benefits portion. And the liability of the taxpayer is lessened over the life of that officer in his retirement. Because the tier three retirees will have social security if they choose to, they'll have their defined contribution plan, and they'll have their personal savings, and they'll work longer, and they'll retire later. Okay, so that tier three is where you, the cities, and the city councils need to look at for your new hires. I say that not because I don't say you don't need police or fire, but if you're looking for the solvency of this system, you have to look at that issue. You really do have to look at it. And I can tell you, having been sitting through those meetings for a year, that the new ones that come on after the first of the year, if you can delay your hire, hiring until after July 1st of 2017, you will lessen that burden for the taxpayers of your community by hundreds of thousands of dollars per individual. So I just wanted to say that. Um, as to your recommendations, um, you should forward something that up to um, the, the unions up there. I mean, we talk to those guys every day, and I'm sure if they want to do that, they'll come over and talk to us about it. And I'll be glad to look at that. But I will say this. After that exhausting year to get Prop 124, there is very little inclination for the legislature to want to revisit the retirement uh, system, okay? I mean, they, they, they just have had it uh, for a year, and now they want to rest maybe in another year. I don't know. But I can tell you there is no desire to revisit and, and try to redo Prop 124. But uh, some changes that you're speaking about should be brought to us. And I'm sure that we'd be glad to look at them. Thank you. Thank you, No. Any other comments, anyone? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mike. Yeah, I, I just happened to read a, a letter to the editor the other day regarding the uh, PSPRS uh, situation in Prescott. And I think the mayor there had suggested, and it sounds like there's really no options uh, right now to address that. I know we're going to be addressing that in our budget uh, review, but I guess some of the suggestions were to uh, increase, as we're talking about, the gas tax sales tax, or actually um, uh, consider amending the years on a constitution to re remove the pension requirements. Are, are those realistic at all? I can almost guarantee you that to try to remove the constitutional yeah. clause that protects the retirement from reducing or diminution would, would result in the uh, police and firefighters unions coming out of the woodwork. That is their bottom line. They are not about to give that up. Now, if five or six cities in this state got so far underwater with their PSPR debt that they filed for bankruptcy in court together, that would, that would definitely send a shot across the bow. Because uh, I don't know, there are some cities, Bisbee, Flagstaff, Prescott, that are, that are really underwater with their pension debt. Now, how far they can go on that, I, I can't tell you that. But the only way that to, get, to address that issue about changing the Constitution 
would require uh, a major catastrophe uh, that, on that order. Now, remember, if you file for bankruptcy, it doesn't mean that takes years. It, it doesn't happen overnight. And I'm not recommending that. But, but you're asking, is there any effort to do that? Absent that, no. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Chief, anything else? No, thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, legislators. Okay, this time, we got. I know that uh, Laura has a comment. Uh, Superintendent Streeter has a comment. Why don't you come on up, Dan? And I'll be brief. I I work with everybody on this. Uh, council one time or another and we have great dialogue that's that's uh, been ongoing so um, I want to start off I, I do need I want the council to know and, and hear me uh, just thank Senator Fan for your hard work uh, last year and helping us out the JTEDs the current year funding um, representative Campbell as well I, I know that we had dialogue throughout the session and Representative Stringer we've already had uh, uh, several conversations so the dialogues uh, we're, we're fortunate here and that we have uh, a relationship where we can have these dialogues. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, Humboldt's had a really a great relationship with the town and, and really we have a symbiotic relationship if you will as as the district flourishes the town flourishes as the town flourishes the district flourishes. Um, we are the largest employer in Prescott Valley and many of the jobs that we have in the district are salary jobs benefited jobs uh, bringing high-level people to our community. We're a big part of the economic health and and the vibrancy of this community, and that partnership has is, is always gone both ways. 5,700 students attend our schools. A uh, majority of those students are in Prescott Valley. We do have students in, in Dewey Humboldt as well, but a large majority of those students are in our community. In addition to the many awards that our schools have received, and, and many of you have been a part of that, uh, we've had tremendous success from a student achievement standpoint. Um, just the AP, the Advanced Placement Academy at the high school, those students are scoring at the highest level in the county. Um, when you look at state assessments, it's typically a, the Advanced Placement Academy students, Tri-City Prep and Basis kind of swapping the top spot depending on the assessment. Um, with partnerships in the town, uh, our IGAs, our, our works with the Parks and Rec Department, uh, us allowing to use the town facilities, the town coming into our schools, uh, the road projects that, that we've talked about, uh, Lakeshore Drive, I know we've been working in partnership to, to help out there, and then the entrance to the high school is, we all know what, uh, <laughs> what an issue that, that is. Uh, the partnership with the school resource officer, uh, an IGA, a shared cost, uh, is much appreciated. It's the work with Youth Arts Month, the Family Arts Festival, um, emergency personnel training. We've, we've worked closely with the, with the police department to run drills in our schools um, on the weekends, although I usually get the calls from the parents wanting to know why the SWAT team was taking over their elementary school. <laughs> um, and then really the town, you guys have been tremendous partners, whether it's student of the month, um, it's the superintendent advisory committee that Marty and Laura Lee sit on and, and been uh, just critical members of that. Uh, government day that uh, uh, Mayor Skoog and the council has put together where our students have been able to work with, with uh, the town of Prescott Valley. Um, Mr. Whitting, we work on the site council. Uh, tremendously appreciated to have that level of involvement. Um, we just recognize students from the school because of the great work that you've done with uh, the flag ceremonies and all the work around the town. So thank you for that. And Mr. Anderson, your work in your civic groups have put you at the school level in so many of our schools, and that's appreciated. Um, one negative partnership is, has been the, um, the refereeing that Larry does with the soccer. <laughs> 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 but uh, with, with, those, with these great partnerships that we have, uh, there, there's three major challenges that we're facing as a school district that, that don't, they don't just impact the school district, they in effect have an impact on the town. And, and our representatives are well aware of these, this isn't new information, but we're, we're looking at the new minimum wage uh, law is going to have an impact on us. You scared me. I thought we were going to up that minimum wage a, a few minutes ago. Um, but that, that's going to be an impact uh, 
to the district's budget. Uh, going up to $10 an hour back on January 1st, that impacted 148 employees. As we get to $12 an hour over the next few years, and you look at classified staff moving on that schedule and still ensuring that you're, you're adjusting for classification levels, because right now we have supervisors that are making the same amount of money as the people that they're overseeing, that's gonna be an impact to our budget of about $750,000. And so that, that's a challenge that we're gonna have and, and we're gonna ask you to help us, although you didn't create that one, we just need your help. Um, attracting and retaining teachers is obviously the second issue uh, that we have up here. There's, there's a teacher shortage in Arizona, obviously we're not immune to that. And then the third one is capital funding, and, and we've had extensive conversations about that. And, and really, I could go back to a lot of the things that Norm said with regards to roads. It's the same, same pieces in the school district, uh, making sure that we have preventative maintenance uh, procedures in place. So those are the three main issues. We've had great dialogue on that. I, I think our representatives are aware of that. I want to thank you guys for the tremendous partnerships that we have and, and we'll continue to work together and we'll continue to work with, with the representatives that we have down at the state capitol. So if there's any questions, I'll answer those. Questions, anyone? Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Did you say there's any comments? <clears throat> Laura, you had a comment? I have a request. Um, as you all know, I'm very involved in the restoration of forests, particularly in our watershed. And I don't want to ask for any money, but I want to ask for grit and I want to ask for support because we don't currently have any legislation, but coming at you, it's going to be some pretty tense legislation. It's going to have to do with uh, state land use and transporting. And I personally don't know how I will manage another devastating crown fire anywhere in Arizona let alone in our own watershed. We have a group here uh, locally that are battling us. Um, they're very concerned about the science of using biomass for energy, and they're going against us and going to really be difficult. Well, they're pretty uneducated about this. Number one, we have multiple uses for this biomass. My favorite is, everybody knows, is essential oils. We have soil amendment. We have animal bedding. Uh, we even have a very interesting, which I haven't talked to any of you about, but I think Larry knows about. We have a, a company interested in taking our biomass and utilizing um, feces from chickens and creating a very specialized fertilizer. So what I'm saying to you is regardless of what happens with our coal fires, which we've already had at the Drake and it was successful, we don't have the data from Drake yet. But we must solve the problems, and I'm asking again for your support and your grit when the legislation comes forward that we have to make changes with how we take off our biomass from state lands. We aren't that disturbed here in Yavapai County because we only have 27% of state lands. So that you know, we're moving full steam ahead here in Yavapai County because we have the state forestry supporting us and thank the blessings of our state, our, our ranchers and our, our landowners. They've already let us go use their property. So the day's gonna come when you're going to need to support us so that we can finalize this final large impediment 
to restoring our forests to a healthy natural habitat. And the final thing I want to say, this is not about biomass. Biomass is, is a byproduct of having a healthy watershed and perhaps getting more water into our aquifer. And the only way we're ever going to be able to do that is to move ahead. And I cannot believe that you would not support the legislation when that day comes. And I'm asking you now to have grit. And if you don't know what grit stands for, I'll be glad to tell you after the meeting. Any other uh, comments, anyone? Anyway? Mayor, I just had something I wanted to interject, and I know most of you all know this, um, so I'm, I'm mostly saying this because I know people watch this on TV that we play, and I wanted to make sure that um, our local residents and constituents knew this. Um, we do have so many needs, um, education, her funds, uh, a PSPRS funding problem we have to fix. The list goes on, and, and we mentioned so many of them tonight. Um, a couple of things that I want to make sure that everybody understands. When you look at the general budget so that everybody knows, because God knows we work so hard, we try so hard to take care of not only our local communities, but look at the whole state as a whole. In recent years, the, um, the entire state budget total, which you never really hear this number, is $32 billion, of which... Uh, 20 some billion of them we have it we don't even get to even touch it's passed through federal stuff through federal programs the, when we get a budget we start to look at it is somewhere around 9.2 9.3 billion dollars well roughly about 7 billion of that we don't get to touch that either because it's all voter protected or it's already set in concrete and we can't touch that either so when the three of us are starting to work on this on the state budget. We've got maybe $2 billion to look at. Well, about half of that goes to just running the government. That is Department of Economic Security. Um, that is all of the, what makes the state turn and turn and turn. Then we look at more money for DPS. Then we look at this, then we look at that. We talk about, um, not only did we, are we short money for everything now, but once again, our hands are being tied because the voters have now mandated a higher minimum wage. It, didn't, it doesn't just hit the schools and hits all of our nonprofits, many of our businesses, but it's going to hit the general fund because not only did it hit the state, but now we've got to come up with those monies to help the schools and all of the other nonprofits and other organizations that work in the state that has contracts with us. So that $2 billion little slice of pie that we even get to work with has now gotten even smaller. And the last little piece that I want to make sure that the, the voters know about is there is a thing called Prop 108 in Arizona. And that means not only it, even if all 90 of us legislators and the governor all voted in favor of a 10 cent fuel tax, a modest increase to help fund schools, a modest increase to help anything, we can't do it. By law, we can't raise taxes because our constitution says only the voters can do it. The best we can do is put it on the ballot and ask the voters to vote on it. And I don't think a lot of people really understand that. Um, and that's our frustration, is because we sincerely do know that we need extra funds for some of these things. So when we get to that point, whether it's Knowles Bill or an, an, our, our new education funding bill we're working on, a new 301, um, we need everybody's help. We need every mayor, every council person, every PTA, school superintendent. We've got to all pull together and get that message out to every one of our constituents throughout the entire state why this is important for our kids, for our communities, for our infrastructure, and for our safety. 
I just want to say in closing, uh, Laura Lee, um, you have my total commitment to that project. I've been involved in it now for a couple of years. I, I think it would be a great thing for this state, for our economy, if we can get the state trust lands to quickly help us assign a value to that biomass that's there and uh, we can start getting private industry and pulling all the strings together. We know the project works and uh, I'm totally excited about it. Uh, I will do anything I can in my, in my office to help you or help that project. Uh, but we right now, uh, we're just waiting for um, Lisa Atkins to determine uh, through her department uh, what assigned value uh, this biomass is going to have. But once that is determined, I think it's, uh, we can really proceed ahead, and I'm looking forward to working on that project uh, for the county and uh, for the state. No, thank you. I, just to echo no, uh, Noel, um, I have been at some of the presentations that uh, uh, that you've been at, and, and I'm familiar with this issue on the biomass, and I do I do support it. I think it's the right way uh, for us to go. I haven't seen the legislation. I don't know if there's actual legislation that's been no, proposed it, yet. It right? isn't even proposed, but it's coming. That's why I need your support and grant. Well, the devil is in the details. We'll have to take a look at the legislation. But legislation, but in concept, uh, I am I'm very sympathetic to the bi biomass. Uh, idea. Uh, I wanted to comment, though, on this issue that uh, Mr. Streeter alluded to. It's a is it seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar impact to your? Is that what you said? Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar impact to? And is that every year? Yes. Once we get to the twelve dollars, and then yeah. the adjustment after that, it'll be an annual impact. Yeah. So so it starts out a little bit lower, but it's going to be incremental up to twelve dollars an hour. And I know it's going to impact the city. It's going to impact the city of Prescott. It's going to impact probably every school district around the country. Think what kind of an impact this is having on small businesses. My point is, where were you guys? Where were the politicians? Uh, where were the school superintendents? Where were all the public officials who knew that there was going to be dramatic impact to their budgets if this thing passed? I know that Karen and Noel and I were all quoted as opposing Prop 206. But where was everybody else? There are enormous uh, unintended consequences, but not totally unforeseen. Any, any public official who dealing with a budget, uh, any businessman dealing with a budget knew this was coming. But I'm, I'm really surprised that uh, so many people are surprised uh, that it's going to have such dramatic impact on their budgets. But if you think it's impacting uh, the public sector, think what kind of difficulty this is creating in the private sector, not just this year with, a ten to, with an increase uh, nearly 20 percent from $8 to $10, but next year to $11 and then ultimately to $12. Uh, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there. Where was the political courage uh, to inform the public of the potential consequences of this, and who will ultimately bear the cost of this? It's going to be the consumer. It's going to be the taxpayer. So I think we we've ended up with a very unfortunate piece of legislation that I didn't hear a lo whole lot of people speaking out against. Uh, during that campaign. I did. I know Noel and, and Karen did, uh, but I didn't hear uh, a lot of other people speaking out against this. I, I agree with you. There were several of us that did, but at the level where it needed to happen, it did not happen. Unfortunately, I, you're absolutely right. I think the voters across the state were uh, disserved by the lack of political courage and public discussion on this issue. I know Go Governor Doug Ducey uh, opposed it. Uh, other, other prominent officials opposed it. But there was really very little debate. And I think the voters ended up uneducated as the potential consequences. And I think we're stuck with it. Maybe it needs to be revis revisited on another initiative. But any other comments, anyone? I th think we're uh, very fortunate in this, in our community. For one thing, the council that I work with is absolutely a great council. We're lucky enough to have uh, really good public officials here in Yavapai County. We're very fortunate to have you as our legislators, and I, we appreciate that. And uh, believe me, I know from Karen, she's been our great legislator for many years. Noel has done a good job in his first term. And I expect, uh, David, that we'll hear good things about you, too. I think you're, you're on track. We appreciate that. I'm telling a lot of people good things about myself, so I'm trying to 
<laughs> yeah, quit thinking about yourself. No, you're, you're great. We're, we're very happy with that. We're, we're very uh, happy to have you as our representatives. And just, just keep up the good work. Council, have any last minute comments? Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I, I do uh, really appreciate the ideas you have that you uh, addressed at the beginning of our, our meeting. I, I support those totally. And, and if there's a way that I can help or the council can help, we want to hear from you to support those things. So don't uh, you know hesitate to uh, let us know what we can do. Okay, uh, Laura. I, I want to echo that. I meant to say that before, but I'm so passionate about restoring our watersheds. I want you to fully understand that it's not a one-way street. We aren't always going to be just willing to come and ask you for things. We want to support you, and we want you, to, as, as it's been stated, to feel welcome to come here and educate us and ask for our support. In fact, I, I think we almost would, we would definitely welcome that. Good, thank you. Mary, you last minute. I feel the same way. If there's anything at all that I can do to help, reach out to me. Because um, together we can get things done, but separate we get nothing done. So thank, thank you, Mary. You. Any other comments? If not, then I would declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you so much for coming. We're, we appreciate you, and we'll do what we can to make your life both easier and tougher.